Welcome to Roots. This is the vlog stroke podcast seeking to just unpack the roots to some of the core values here in Chanctonbury Churches. Proper discussion, any questions are welcome and we look forward to getting into it with the interns today. So here we are for our first ever uh, vlog, uh, Roots, Chanctonbury Roots, and uh, we're gonna be talking about some of our core values in Chanctonbury churches. And we're hitting our first one, which we opened up on Sunday, uh, Heaven is Here. And really just uh, unpacking the idea that heaven is not a destination we go to when we die. The kingdom of heaven is here within our hearts. And because of Jesus Christ, uh, the heavens are open. God is pouring out his spirit, um, who is uh, bringing the kingdom of heaven through us uh, to the earth. So um, here with our three interns, um, here with Louise and uh, we just wanted to allow a bit of space just to uh, field a few questions, unpack um, uh, a few thoughts and ideas just to develop that, uh, clear up any um, misconceptions or have a go at clarifying some stuff. So um, very simple, um, who's going to pick up first um, question or idea? I was thinking about it, but it might be like your whole sermon, but why do you think God's calling for heaven to be here right now? Just say, what do you mean by that, Jack? Do you think, do you mean as in, um, why is God doing this right now or showing us this stuff right now? Yeah, basically. So like, yeah. So what? Or it's like, sort of. When did you think God, or have you always thought like God is calling heaven to be here right now? I mean, I think how I would answer that is. Um, I think if you look at what Jesus did and the church that um, was set in motion after Pentecost, um, you know, the early church was absolutely on fire. You know, miracles, signs and wonders, you know, characterized uh, the first Christians for about the first 300 years of Christianity. You know, Christians in those days were unique because they would welcome into their community widows and orphans from across the social divides. Whereas in the culture at the time, you know, Jews would look after Jewish widows and orphans, you know, Romans would look after Roman widows and orphans, you know, etc., etc. But the Christians, they'd take anybody. Um, and as um, the early church, you know, just spread across the Mediterranean world, um, it looked like the book of Acts and the same power of the Spirit, the same um, faith, the same... Uh, willingness and capacity to believe the things that Jesus taught and to live them out and even to see greater things than Jesus characterize the church the first 300 years until the Roman Emperor Constantine institutionalized Christianity across the Roman Empire and at that stage what you see is suddenly Christianity becoming socially acceptable suddenly people are coming into the Christian church who haven't necessarily had a personal encounter with God, haven't necessarily laid down their whole lives. And what happens is that coincides with the, um, the, the disappearing of signs and wonders, disappearing of the same um, kingdom of God dynamics, disappearing from the church. And I think over the last 1700 years, God has gradually been restoring that and so I think the reason we are uh, beginning to see some of the incredible things that God is doing right now is simply a culmination of progressive revelation that he's been restoring to the church about who he is, what his plans are, how he is um, wanting to renew the earth. Um, and, you know, you, we forget there's a whole bunch of people who think the earth is just going to, you know explode into a ball of fire and we'll get to heaven and we'll be you know withdrawn from it all and actually beginning to recapture God's original design to be with people to renew the earth that this place would reflect you know the beauty of um the heavens um it is so I don't know if it's just now but suddenly I think we're just waking up to that and are excited to see it can you give us a few bible verses that you spoke on on Sunday just to back it up yeah <laughs> good cool Lee. yeah um yeah so um 
So uh, we might look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 where it says in Christ God was reconciling all people back to himself. So you've got the whole trajectory of reconciliation that God's heart is for all people to know him. You know, the ache that every human heart feels, you know, disenfranchised, disconnected to God, tries to fill their hearts with all this stuff uh, or any stuff apart from God is really because we're made to know God and to live with him um, so that's um, uh, that's one part uh, Colossians uh, chapter 1 where um, uh, we see God um, restoring all things to himself uh, Romans chapter 8 the whole earth is groaning it's in bondage to decay but waiting for the children of God uh, to rise in glory um, and you know what we find is that basically the biblical narrative of when sin entered the world it wasn't just a matter of personal taintedness before God it actually affected the whole earth um, and which is interesting you know when Jesus gave his last breath you know what happened there was a the earth felt it there's a big earthquake um and so the repercussions of what god is doing not only affect human beings but affects the whole earth and um god is in the process of of restoring that i don't know whether that's enough bible verses for now <laughs> um we could look at some more another time but yeah anyone else got a question Tom. um so yeah i was just thinking about so you were saying how heaven is a place where God's rule is unopposed completely. And so is there, is there like a correlation between our obedience to him and then how much we see happen and how much of heaven we see realised here? Because obviously there isn't, not everything around us right now at this like point is exactly like heaven. So like there are still sick people and there are still, you know, it's not fully... Um, as it should be and so is that a result of just the more that we come into obedience with what he's saying and we don't oppose his will or what he's trying to do that that is there a correlation between that or is that not For, definitely I would say because I think we have a choice as people to live by flesh or by spirit and I think the more we die to ourselves, and the more we realise that it's God in, a, in us to make all of our decisions based on uh, the spirit and God's leading then the more we allow him to reign in our own lives which then affects others because we'll, we'll start to pray for others we'll start to make decisions based on that so I would say definitely Yeah I think um, I completely echo what what Louisa said and and the answer is a full-throated yes I think where the church has focused on salvation as the entry point for Christianity we've almost finished there whereas um, what God desires is not only to save us to ransom us you know through the giving of Jesus and the shedding of his blood and us putting our whole faith and trust in him but then once we're saved, once we've come to know God, it's then to make us look like Jesus. So, you know, um, John chapter 20, um, the risen, resurrected Jesus meets with, with his disciples and he says, you know, to them, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. So when Jesus ascends into heaven and sends the Spirit, you know, what what his heart then is having restored us ransomed us from our sins having released new life to us through the resurrection having ascended on high and taken us up into um our status as children of god with with and in christ reigning with him in the heavenly places he then sends the spirit on us so that we have the power the capacity to actually live like jesus think like jesus act like Jesus um, so that you know and that's why Jesus calls the church um, or Paul the apostle Paul calls the church the body of Christ so um, we are his hands and feet on earth to look like him and to be like him wherever we go so in answer in answer to your original question 
coming into obedience is really just agreeing with God's desire to make us like him which is actually the loveliest most wonderful thing that he could desire for us because he is love he is light he is you know glory and peace and joy and he wants us to be like him um and it's our privilege then to be like him to everyone around us and to shine him wherever we go yeah just to like another question that kind of leads on from that is it's so easy to then but how do you not let yourself slip into it being about what you do and your works because it's really easy once you like let the idea of being like okay i've got to be like jesus to then try and be like jesus as opposed to just accepting that he's like renewing your but that, you know it's like i do that without even realizing doing that so uh, what would you say is a good way of not letting yourself slip into it just being about works and what you do and oh, i'm trying really hard to be like jesus um i would say for me personally it's got to be about that day-to-day hanging out with god because otherwise it can be um, works-based. It can be, oh, I've got to be like this. I've got to be like the other. I've got to pray for people. And actually, it's not. We need the Holy Spirit, actually. We don't need to just do, try hard and do better. We need him to dwell in us and just to overflow. Yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's a hard one. And I think what it is, is all about um, trying to be in tune with the intentions of our hearts because the fact is we live in a world which measures us by our performance so you know you guys have just done your a levels which is the culmination of you know 15 years of education and then you comes down to these final exams and then you get grades on how well you've done or not how well you've done you know although you guys have all done brilliantly um Living like Jesus, if we approach it in terms of, well, okay, I've got to be like him. You know, he wants me to be like him. Therefore, I've got to do this. Um, suddenly feels like a terrible burden unless we know um, the power and victory of what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. The reason God sent Jesus is because none of us could um, make up for the debt that we owe to God for not living as, as we should. And in his mercy and his kindness, he sent Jesus to be for us. Which is why, you know, one of the descriptions Jesus gave himself is he is the son of man. As I said on, on Sunday, being inclusive, the son of people. He came as one of us to do what we could not do. And when he gave his, uh, one of his last breaths, he cried out in agony at the time, it is finished. And what was finished was, according to Isaiah chapter 53, was that God was laying on Jesus Christ all of the pain, the suffering, the brokenness, or in Bible words, the iniquity of the whole world, past, present in the time of Jesus, and future. So that means, if we believe that everything that separates us from God, everything that God could possibly um, find grievous about our actions our behaviors our attitudes if that has been nailed to the cross then there's no kind of attempt of me trying to twist God's arm to make him like me or or try and show him how well I'm doing that's going to impress him because everything has already been done by Jesus so when I have that as a foundation in my heart then I'm like okay if I'm in Jesus and he has done all the work for me, which is one of the key messages of the book of Hebrews, where it talks about, and there's a sort of weird conundrum in Hebrews, it says, make every effort to live in the rest that Christ has won for us. If I rest in what Jesus has done, then simply I, I can wake up in the morning and say, okay, I don't deserve to know God but because of his amazing love and kindness and generosity, I know him. And therefore I get to discover all that he is and all that he has for me. And I get to receive from him everything that I need and everything that he wants to form in me to make me look like Jesus to everyone around me. Does that make sense? Now sometimes we can all, all hear some stuff in our heads which says, well, we should be doing this. I don't pray as much as Tom. You know, I'm not as kind as Sophie. I'm not, you know, as good at football as Jack or whatever it is. You know, and, and some of it is about saying, do you know what? 
all of those performance indicators, I need to break off the intentions of my heart and just say, wow, this is just a journey of discovery to just know God and you know to, to try and receive as much from Him as I can, which comes from exactly like Louise said, spending time with Him, praying, you know, reading the scriptures, you know, creating moments to be in his presence, trying to engage our hearts at every moment of the day with who he is, finding people around us to just spur us on and teach us and grow us. I think it's also um, the revelation that we are not living as a slave master. You know, we're not there to please him all the time. Actually, we're his children and he delights in us. And it's that mentality of I'm a son, I'm a daughter of our father. So I don't have to you know, please him all the time or he just loves me for who I am and being free to receive that love. I, mean, that's, I was just thinking, that is just such a radical message in our culture, isn't it? I mean, how many people do we meet who don't like the idea of God because they assume that um, either he's probably inflicted some family pain or trauma in their lives upon them or that you know, the idea of God, you know, I couldn't really go near him because he's going to judge me or, you know, because I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy enough. I mean, what a message, you know, that we have of Jesus who, you know, paid the price for us all. I mean, and then you think, why wouldn't, why wouldn't we come to God? You know, why wouldn't we want to know him? So, yeah. Jack, back to you. Um, I was just going to ask, so like, some people might be watching this being like, um, I'm reading the scriptures, I'm doing the Bible, I'm, you know, um, go to church, um, but I'm not confident in, like, that culture, like, the kingdom come culture. So, like, what would you say as a, I don't know, as a, I don't know, like a beginner, like, sort of, um, what would you say, how would you encourage them to go and be that light to, the, to their communities? I think for me, you've got to take it back to the Gospels. You know, you've got to look at what Jesus did and the fact that we are meant to follow Jesus. He is called the second Adam. He is Adam. We, you know, were from Adam. We follow his path. We are meant to be like Jesus. So you go back, you look at what he did, and you ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to fill you to be like Jesus and to do the stuff that he did. That's what, that's what I do regularly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think so often we read, read the Bible and we think Jesus is a hero who has kind of like done something incredible, you know, but it's kind of beyond our reach. Now, if we begin to read the scriptures and we realize that from the beginning, God always desired, he didn't desire that the world would get messed up. He desired simply that creation would reflect heaven you know, the uncreated, um, and it was a sort of creative expression of who God, who God is. Um, then, it get, then it got messed up, as we know, and then God sent his own son as one of us to restore everything that had been lost. Um, so now, so he's, he's a hero in that sense, but he, he came as a hero to restore also who we are as human beings. So if you then start reading the Gospels thinking, okay, well, if I read this carefully, I realize that Jesus, prior to a key episode, didn't do any of his miracles, didn't talk to God in a way that any of us can't um, before he was 30 years old. You know, you don't read anything prior to the age of around 30 um, of Jesus turning water into wine, walking on water. He, He... all we kind of know about Jesus' earlier life is that he lived, you know, a good life. Um, he, he clearly had some wisdom beyond his years that we read in the Gospels when he was found in the temple talking with the teachers of the law and they were surprised about that. But the key moment was when Jesus was baptised in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. And what happened in that moment, we remember, is the heavens open, the Father speaks down, this is my son whom I love, so Jesus is receiving that identity and affirmation of the Father. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And from that moment on, Jesus begins his ministry and begins to um, teach with authority, um, begins to um, head towards Jerusalem, begins to uh, 
perform signs and wonders, you know, etc., etc., etc. So that for me says to me that Jesus has done those things as a human being, not with his God powers, as one of us, in order to show us what it looks like for human existence um, to be fully empowered with the Holy Spirit. Then you start reading the Gospels and you start thinking, well, Jesus said, um, John chapter 14, I'm going to prepare a place. Um, I'm going to the Father to prepare a place. And when I come to you, and I think that's once he's risen from the dead, I'm going to take you to be where I am. Um, And where I am, there you will be also. So Jesus is is basically saying, I think in John chapter 14, my relationship with the Father uh, that I've... um, known and received i talked to him i received from him Um, i'm now going to do what is required for me to take you to the father's presence he then goes on in chapter 14 to say um you know uh he's talking about the uh, the disciples are asking him about you know how can we believe your words and jesus says well if you don't believe my words, look at the fruit from them. Look at the miracles I've been doing. Look at the vindication from God, the affirmation from God when I've been healing the sick or, um, you know, raising the dead or cleansing the leper or, you know, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, multiplying food. And Jesus says, you're going to do even greater things than these. Um, and so the whole, the whole way, just to answer your question, Jack, is, is to then start with the gospels like louise said and and realize that jesus has done this in order to make us like him now not like him as a savior because none of us can you know pay a price for anybody else but to make us live know god minister and act like he did have the same relationship with the father jesus enjoyed um to you know hear god's voice with the same clarity jesus did um to discern god's will to know how to bring divine solutions to earthly problems in every situation um, and that's why Jesus says as I referred to earlier as the father sent me boom so I'm sending you um, and then you see you know obviously post Pentecost that's what happened to the disciples they were transformed they began to do the things that Jesus did um, you know etc etc does that answer your question so I would say if you're in, if you're in a church which like does, doesn't believe that by all means, always honour your church authorities. But I think it's really important for us all to read the scriptures for ourselves, you know, to, to really, you know, think these things through and think, hang on a minute, wow, there's some verses here that, that seem to suggest that we're meant to be doing those things, you know. And if you look carefully then through Paul's letters and the sort of thrust of the New Testament, we see the, the church living, acting and moving with the same ministry, the same um, sort of characteristics, the same dynamics that Jesus uh, seemed to live with. Right, we're going to close this first one up with one final question. So has anyone, anyone got something? Tom, back to you. Um, oh, it's, which one do I, do I pick now? Um, yeah, so, okay, I think one of the things that I've struggled to understand quite a lot is the whole concept of like we say heaven is in us and that's like it kind of makes sense but I think it's one of the things that I find really easy to just say but then not fully get what I'm actually talking about because um, like what does it really mean for heaven to be in each and every like one of us or what does that that mean if heaven is you know I don't fully understand that yet um, so to the only yeah um great question um great question i think i think what that means is let let's use a word which matthew associates with heaven um which is kingdom so you know a kingdom is a boundaried territory where whoever rules the kingdom has um sovereign choice and rulership over what happens so in, in, in the united kingdom where we live the queen is our sovereign over the boundaries area of england scotland northern ireland wales um and you know ultimately she reigns and is in charge obviously delegated through parliament etc etc every human being 
carries a kingdom within them. So, you know, the boundary of your kingdom is, you know, your body, your mind, your heart. So within the external influences of the country we're born in, the family, the household we live under, school we go to, etc., etc., you know, we all have choices, you know, each and every day to do this to do that to wear this jumper to wear that jumper you know we are all you know kings in our kingdoms and what i think it means to say heaven is here resident within us is about saying when we come to know jesus what that means is that when we declare him as our lord as our king what we're doing is we're giving up rulership of our own kingdom in our hearts and we're saying Jesus you be my king I choose to follow you exactly as the first disciples did now what what happens at that moment is that we are then born again into the kingdom of heaven and um, we are spiritually we receive a citizenship um, which is what the apostle Paul talks about in another kingdom so although all of us here are English, you know, we actually have another passport citizenship given to us, um, which is um, in heaven, you know, paid for, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, and which will go on forever and ever and ever. But that's not just something, you know, in eternity in heaven. There's also something that comes the other way. Going back to John chapter 14, you know, Jesus says... Um, I'm in the Father, the Father is in me, and we're going to make our home in you. And so when we're born again, we not only go into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven also comes into us. And I find it stunning that when Jesus says, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, and we will make our home in you, I find that stunning to think that not just Jesus, not just the Father, Add the, the whole triune God comes to take up residence in our kingdom. And, um, you know, when we say heaven is here, if heaven is the place where Jesus' reign is unhindered, fully expressed, and when I'm making Jesus Lord, then what's happening is that kingdom of heaven is now being able to be displayed and manifest and grown within our hearts. Now, that doesn't mean everything changes because Jesus teaches that the kingdom of heaven starts as a mustard seed and grows and grows and grows and so even as we begin to give more and more of our attitudes, our behaviours our hearts, our memories, our inclinations, our tastes, our appetites, everything as we learn what it is to have everything brought under the rule of Jesus, as we allow him to transform everything within us, then what happens is is the kingdom of heaven in our hearts grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and um, you know Paul talks in um, uh, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 3 about how what happens is we receive glory at that moment and God transforms us from one degree of glory to another so we receive heaven as a seed within our hearts and it, and it grows into a, the biggest tree in our lives as we as we grow up does that make any sense all right guys awesome to hang out boom heaven is here here we go thanks so much for watching uh, it's been great to uh have you with us uh this has been roots if you have any questions which uh didn't come out today uh things you'd love to hear more about or develop uh, do email me on james at chanctonbury.org.uk um, look forward to hearing from you